Hey, hi everyone, how are you? As usual, I will say, hey, and then we'll hold on just one second and wait for all the technology to click fully into place and see some people showing up. And when I see that, I know for sure we're good to go. So hang on just one second. <clears throat> all right. It's interesting, in, in past streams I've actually said uh, it, it's showing up in StreamYard, which if I haven't mentioned, that's the platform I'm using, I'm enjoying it, it's called StreamYard, and um, it doesn't always show the person's name. And I just saw a little message here from StreamYard, it says some LinkedIn comments won't show uh, a name or picture. Interesting, okay, so it's a strange limitation in the link between StreamYard and LinkedIn. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen, our first person pops up. So now I know <clears throat> we are streaming. It usually takes 30 seconds to a minute. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I will disable one more thing and be fully yours. There we go. All right. Hey, how are you? I'm coming to you live from Houston, Texas, where believe me when I tell you, we're seeing entirely too much rain. I don't know where you are on planet Earth. In fact, it's one of my favorite things to see right there in comments. So please tell me where you're from uh, when you say hello. I would love that. I'm in Houston and we have seen yet another weather incident. Oh, yeah. Uh, I live in a place called the Heights, which is actually kind of uh, literal. We're one of the higher places around Houston and we really don't have flooding problems. And that makes me very, very lucky, but a whole lot of people in all kinds of neighborhoods across this town are struggling a little bit with uh, various types of water runoff and flooding. Tough stuff. I hope you're well. Um, I'm feeling a little off because I like to exercise, which is usually a combination of walking and running and stairs and things like that. That's been really good for me lately, but not during the crazy multiple days of rain. So today might be our first break. I'm very excited about a few things today. I booked a gig. I get to talk to you, and I think I'm going to go out and exercise later and maybe not get rained on. So I'm very excited. Hey, Debbie SFO, what's happening? Jorge, Dominican Republic, what's up? Good to see you. Isaac, Dubai, what's happening, man? Maryam, Morocco, hi. Miss Baker, Missouri, no, I can count on you. Good to see you. Helen in England, lovely to have you. Wow, Boca Raton. Colette from France, Walid from Tunisia, and Miss Laura Dean, one of my favorite people, says the shelving and certificates look great. <laughs> I've been working on a new office. Thanks, Laura, for noticing. And as you'll see behind me, put up some traditional office things that maybe won't look uh, too ragtag or, or uh, strange to you. Just some some books I've written, some other knickknacks, uh, degrees, all the typical stuff, but hopefully it's uh, okay looking for something behind me. How are you? We, uh, you know, when I started saying this, I thought I'd only say it two or three times, and apparently I'm going to say it for quite a while. How are you? Isn't this virus ever present? I don't know what's going on where you live, uh, but the news suggests that Europe and lots of other places are seeing a potential resurgence in half of our country, at least, or more in the States is also doing the same. Now you can explain it in a million different ways. And I know that people like to argue, which isn't terribly productive, frankly, uh, but it's getting maybe a little worse again. And that's horrible. Um, so I hope you're well. I hope you're coping. I hope you're finding connections with people or exercise, a decent diet, a great book, a call with a loved one, something. Don't let yourself sit there and stew in deep dive on the news too much. That's not good. I'll tell you something else. You cannot deep dive on too much or it'll drive you crazy. And that is today's topic, hell gigs and haters. Oh yeah, a lot of people thought that was interesting when I came up with the title. Well, look, if you're a solopreneur like me, you have to not only deliver useful information, but you really need to figure out a way to deliver it, uh, to get people's attention, to make them kind of remember and, and care. And so I could talk about, hey, not everyone's always going to love and support you. And that's true. Or I could say, uh, have you ever had any hell gigs or haters? Those things are, well, they're real. And I've experienced them just as much as anybody. And we should probably talk about them. So we're going to do that in just a second. Dean, sir, great to see you. New Jersey in the house. Netherlands, Carson, hey, how are you? 
Istanbul. How are you, sir? We got London. We got Boston. It's crazy, man. Last time I saw the rock fingers laying sideways. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'm trying to actually create a more organized and professional and consistent background. Who knows? We'll see. I'm going to change it up again in just a few weeks. A little preview. I'll talk about this today a couple different ways. The next book is almost done. Getting the last little look through from the editor. It's called Live Hard. One of the topics in Live Hard is hell gigs and haters. I think this is an important topic. I mean that. And, and uh, like many topics that uh, I rant about, the truth is it started with me uh, being confronted with an issue I needed to process. And I did that. And then I thought about it. And a lot of the times I realized, guess what? You, or tons of you anyway, have the same issues that I face, some version of the same issues. And I should probably think about sharing some thoughts on the matter. Uh, so here it goes. I love talking about success. You call me a a leadership guy, a success person, uh, teams, relationships, that whole ball of wax. I love talking about that. It's fun. But here's the truth. If you're good at it, if you're successful at being successful, there will be some interesting downsides and curveballs you never saw coming. That's right. The more you're successful, the more odd things you didn't expect, in fact, will happen because of your success. Sometimes it's not even because of your success. It's just because of this fact. No one is loved all the time by everyone. Sorry, it just doesn't happen. If you're going to be in a, a semi-public role the way I am, believe me, you better grow some thick skin and embrace today's topic because you will never be simplistically loved by everyone all the time. That's life. You know this. I know this, but we probably need to think about how to process it and be prepared for it and deal with it a little more effectively. Lisa, how are you? Dayton, Ohio. What's up, Dayton? I spent 10 amazing years in Dayton, and I do miss that place for sure. So answer this question. What are the uh, odds that you, in the next year or so, are going to experience a bout uh, of nastiness from a hater or a horrible task or project or event that you might think of as a hell gig? What are the odds? The odds are almost 100%. Over five and 10 years, 100% chance that you're going to experience this. The only question is, what will you do when it happens? Because it's an inevitability, absolutely, positively. I don't care whether it's a task or an event, it's inevitable. Now, I'll pick on me just to make you smile and put things in perspective for just a moment, because boy, have I experienced some hell gigs and haters over time. Yeah, listen, if I want it to be um, too full of myself and go, okay, let's brag for a minute. You know what? I could do that for a while. I got lots of caffeine and lots of accolades, and boy, that could lead to some ragged. Ah, two-time TEDx or hey, PhD, all that garbage. That's fun to talk about when I really have to. Mostly, I don't like to do that because you know what, you should live or die doing this by delivering content, just delivering content that matters. I love doing that. I can talk about good stuff I've done forever. It's not going to teach anything. Uh, more important, more instrumental would be for me to tell you about the times that, man, people just did not like me. And I've got tons of those. Now, if you read the, the book that kind of put me on the maps called Show Your Ink, there's a story in there about a time I stood on stage, big gig, lots of senior folks, 500 plus people in the audience at a little firm you might have heard of called State Farm. <laughs> it's a pretty famous story in my world. I've shared it forever. I bet you I'll never stop sharing it because it's simple and powerful and people can relate. And it's about a time that I gave a presentation, which is hard for me to say to this day because I pride myself on being a really effective public speaker. Uh, the truth is that day I was horrible and people reacted horribly. It was kind of a combination of a hell gig and one full of haters because my performance was so bad that it really evoked some not so productive responses. I mean, they didn't throw things at me that day, but they really did throw some ugly looks my way and some false compliments my way. Believe me, I learned more from that gig with State Farm than any other gig I've done, and I've done over a thousand. So I have to tell you, there's a silver lining. That's a big part of our conversation today. There is a silver lining. Let me stop before I forget and remind you, yes, we're live, but I see your comments and I'd like to answer your questions. If you have a question about somehow related to today's topic, dealing with these unfortunate, difficult realities, hell gigs and haters, Hey, drop it into uh, the, the chat there. I'd love to try and address it in just a few minutes. Yeah, State Farm taught me a lot. Wasn't even my biggest hell gig. Would you like to know what that was? 
Oh, jeez. I wrote about this in the book. True story. Yeah, like I said, it's fun getting on stage. I love doing that. I don't do it as much now because of the pandemic. I can't wait to get back to doing that again. But I can tell you, it doesn't always go like you think it will. The difference between a great pro and an average speaker isn't what you might think. You might think that the great pro just has everyone love them, right? You just get tears, you get applause, you get everyone listening and everyone believing. No, the truth, the truth, and I know a lot of speakers, a whole lot, a few I will flat out admit are better than me, even though I'm probably around the 15th percentile, if I may be honest. The truth is, the difference is a better batting average. You never get everyone fully, but you have a better battering average, a much better batting average. Okay, I admit that, but you never get everyone. I spent 10 years in the classroom. I loved that, but for every 50 students that looked at me and said, that was value added and thank you. Uh, there was one, sometimes two, that went, man, what a waste of my time. I don't like your personality and how you deliver. Ugh, next class, please. Yeah, happened all the time. Biggest uh, hell gig ever. Here goes. I'm going to give you the short version of the very short version of the story. I'm on stage, big gig, oh, maybe 400 people for this client in the audience, uh, major hotel in a big city, all that. I'm, I'm talking. Things are going well, I think, but I'm not sure. Here's why. This gig, which is about a third of the gigs for me, big lights, lighting structure, which means I am really visible to the audience, but I can't see anything. <laughs> and I think things are going okay because I hear laughs when I'm supposed to hear laughs. I hear a uh, noise that I'm used to hearing at the right times. So that feels good. But at some point, a meeting, the meeting planner who hired me and was managing the event that day uh, from inside the client runs up to the stage and uh, just looks at me. Uh, it was really awkward because people are watching this person speak to me. It says, you know, some, some, something like this. <sighs> you got five minutes. And I thought to myself, I'm embarrassed. Are you kidding me? I lost track of time. I never do that. I, I'm usually a pro. Apparently, uh, I had messed up that day. And I started just skipping strategic things. No one knew this except me. And then I started to wrap up. And then about five minutes later, before I was done, same person comes back up and gets my attention again. I notice as I duck down beneath the lights, everyone's looking at us. And he tells me, it's okay, keep going. It's okay, you have some more time. And I thought to myself, what's going on? Did this person make the mistake? Well, let me tell you, this is the uh, truncated version of the story. I found out later what happened. There was a person in the audience listening to one of my stories. And that, that day I was using one of my old classic stories about my father and something he taught me during his journey with cancer. It is an uplifting, useful story loved by many, many people. However, it can be viewed as heavy. It can be anytime you're talking about cancer, right? This person in the audience had a loved one, uh, their spouse, who was going through some very ugly journey with cancer. And they got triggered in the classic sense as they listened to me talk about this topic so candidly. Uh, and they started to cry. And uh, the crying became apparently strong. I didn't hear any of this from the stage. First person that really noticed was the CEO of this organization, got very angry at me, I learned later, because I had created this situation in a very unprofessional way by talking about something that would evoke such a response long, 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 long story short. Uh, the client was very upset with me probably because of one person who believed that it was inappropriate to talk about cancer and the way I was talking about cancer in a way that thousands before had loved. Folks, I don't care who you are. I don't care how great your expertise. You will not be loved full time by everyone. That is completely normal. I found out I was that close to being pulled off the stage that day. Have you ever been there? Have you ever thought you're just doing your job? Or have you ever thought you're doing a great job? You're killing it. And then feedback comes in a, in a visceral way and hits you in the face that you just didn't see coming. You ever been in that position? Anybody? I'd love to see uh, a comment or a question if you have. Man, I got to tell you, it is it is not pleasant, primarily because it is so unexpected. Hey, Pakistan, Columbus, Ohio, Ronnie, Dayton, good to see you. I've got multiple from Dayton today. Kimberly, how are you? Great to see you, you scrappy, scrappy pro. Oh, wonderful to see you. So, I know, Kimberly, I know you have been here as well. You're doing your best and you've done it many times before. And then somehow yeah, others perceive that the rails, that you've gone off the rails. You didn't do it, but they perceive that. Now, listen, 
I don't care what the reality is. You now have to deal with this. The question is, what do you do? Well, I want to help you think through that just a little bit. So we've established that it's normal. It will happen to every single one of you who's ambitious, overachieving, and successful. In fact, it might happen to you even more. So what do you do? First rule of thumb, whether this is a hater or whether this is a hell gig. Now, a hell gig could be some combination of things that led to the, the, the overall performance not being great, a presentation that goes off tracks, who, who knows? Or it could be haters, meaning an otherwise great event that you're engaged in, but one person or multiple people don't like your contribution and they're letting you know. In either case, rule one, man, this is so important. You ready? Do not inflame things. You'll notice I didn't say think deeply about whether or not they're accurate in their assessment that they're showing you in some fashion. Didn't say that. No, they're doing what they're doing. It's happening while you're engaged in a task and your job is first to not make things worse. That's hard to do. And frankly, there's a whole nother rant somewhere in here about your need, all of our needs to grow our emotional intelligence so that in the moment when it's unexpected and there's a need, we can, in a measured and calm and reasonable uh, way, react to something that we didn't see coming. Let me say that again. When something very difficult and unexpected happens, it is not true that you have to react in a big way. You can learn, that's a part of emotional intelligence, to have a measured and reasonable response. That is true. So start with not inflaming. What that means to me, no blame, no anger. I could say this different ways, but these to me are the most instructional. You ready? No blame, which is to say, you don't understand. Did you not hear me? Or can't you read? Or a million other things you might do that cast in a, a, a doubt or blame or an aspersion on someone else. No, you don't do that. You just don't do that. And you don't show anger. You don't show disgust at someone not loving you. You can't do that. It's not fair to you what I'm about to say, but it's very important for you to know this. You never look good. You never look good when you do that. So I want you to resist doing that because usually I say when you're presenting, you're supposed to wake up and be human and show human emotions a little more than normal conversation. Here's the exception. When you're in a performance contest context, whether you're talking to a client informally in the hallway, sitting around a table with your colleagues at a meeting or standing on stage at a conference, as many of you do, you're not supposed to, when this happens, show emotion, especially negative. You're supposed to, for a moment, just a moment, shut that down and make sure your initial response is measured and does not inflame the situation. That's the best thing that you can do for yourself. Okay. If you want to say something, you can, but let's think, what are the conditions that you would want to say something? If someone, just to use the obvious context, a big conversation around a table at a meeting, or maybe a, uh, a presentation to 50 people at a conference, you, many of you have been in these situations commonly, right? So someone uh, has something to say, well, feedback's normal, great, but when it crosses into that critical area where it starts to look like a hater, what do you do? I wish, uh, in fact, maybe someday we'll evolve this platform and have not just a great chat uh, wall here for me to look at, but also live questions. That would be spectacular. Hey, India, how are you? Suhas, great to see you. Amina Ben, hi, good to see you again. So, so what is the right response? Well, I'm going to say something that might surprise you now. One great initial response very often is to ignore. Now, if it's a comment to you in the form of a question or something that asks for your response, ignoring isn't very smart. It can look like condescension. It can cause more problems and you don't want to inflame. But if they just say something out loud or make a gesture, but it's not directed to you or asking for a response from you, or if you're at a conference, you're giving a talk, there's 20, 30, 50 people sitting there. A few people are tuned out in a rude way, speaking to their neighbor, maybe looking at you and talking to their neighbor. Who knows what unexpected, unpleasant thing you might see once in a blue moon Ignoring can be a useful response. What we have is an audience member who doesn't like something, maybe not everything, but something that they heard. Fine, let them get that out. It does not matter. Move on. Your first response, don't inflame. Second response, hey, is it okay to move on? You'll notice I've not talked about fighting. Why? 
You're never going to be told by me that you're supposed to fight when you face people who maybe don't like what you're doing and act kind of like they want to fight. No, anger begets anger. It's never useful. It never makes you look good. Don't do that. Consider the possibility of ignoring. I don't like that response. Doesn't make me excited. I think it's wise to consider it. And a big chunk of the time, it's going to be all that you need. Uh, by the way, I can riff if you want me to on the very strange, very strange world we now find ourselves living in online with trolls. I don't know. Maybe that's a whole nother stream that we'll plan uh, for someday. What to do with trolls. Right now, I'm really thinking about face-to-face -face more than anything. Uh, don't engage. Think about ignoring. Here's the next one. Ready? Address them specifically. You've got your emotions in check. Ignoring makes no sense because they're too loud and disruptive or they're addressing you. Too loud and disruptive or they're addressing you. That means you're going to have to address them. What you don't want to do is anything negative, and you don't want to create some conversation that spirals out of control, takes the focus away from all the momentum you were creating in whatever task you and the team or you on stage may have been dealing with. You don't want to do that, but you want to acknowledge because this is an interesting thing. You ready? When you acknowledge people don't like that, they don't like attention, usually they'd much rather be in the audience than on stage typically. So when you give them attention, very often that simple fact, regardless of the issues that are going on with your content or, or their ideas about your content, will shut them down. And that's a beautiful thing. So <laughs> tell them, I hear you. Was there a question? Or, or if they didn't ask a question, you can just look at them and say, can I address that? Because then they're going to have to try and uh, address you or shut down. And they usually shut down. If they are addressing you, say, that's a great point. Now. Now you've addressed them, you've acknowledged them. Here's a beautiful thing, ready? Don't try to actively address them then. What you want to do is acknowledge. Now, you don't always get away with this, but usually you do. Acknowledge and ask them to speak with you offline. Interesting point. I think I know what you're talking about. I want to hear more. Also, I'd like to finish this first. Can you and I chat for just a moment when I'm done? Almost always, they're going to go like this and find that acceptable. It is rare that they wouldn't. And if they wouldn't, you might be forced to speak to them longer and or seek help from others in the room. It's very rare. I don't even need to talk about that because it doesn't happen often. Almost always, you can get away with not inflaming, ignoring some of it because it's not about interacting with you. It's a person who just needed to express something, who felt they needed to express something. Sometimes you do have to acknowledge them and ask for their input and when when you do address them, the number one thing to do is acknowledge not to engage and ask if you can speak to them offline. Now, if you're with the team in a meeting, it might be your norm to have a more active conversation. Feel free. But once again, you want this much of a deviation unless it's very interesting. And everyone wants to hear more and it's core to what you're working on. Otherwise, you address out of respect and interest and inquiry. And then you try and table that and move on and agree to speak to them later. Not a foolproof process, a very effective process. Now, I forget to say this once in a while because I get to go in and uh, I get to go in and I forget that we, have, we are on a clock here. I want to ask you. If you have seen tactics that work in this situation that are different than what I'm sharing that have worked for you, man, I'd love to see them. One of my practices here is to follow up on LinkedIn and try and go through all the comments. And if you'll share there, if you haven't already, thank you. I would love to, to hear what that is and maybe share it with my tribe as well. Um, Hicham, H-I-C-H-A-M. I'm going to tell you real quick, a couple, couple questions before we wrap this up. Hey, who cares if I run long? It's, uh, it's my show. Can negative feedback help us grow? Yes. You definitely don't want to ignore forever that person. Great question. Thank you. Yes, it's the only thing really that pushes us to grow. Positive feedback makes us feel good and feeling good and confident helps us engage behaviors that can lead to growth, but that's an indirect effect. Negative, critical, difficult, heavy feedback. Oh, so many people get crushed by it. It is the fuel that helps us get better. The only question is, can you get better at processing it, figuring out what parts of it make sense, what parts to dismiss? That is an amazing skill that you can learn. Central question. Thank you for asking that. Mary, hey, uh, how do you recover quickly your mental harmony? I like that phrase. After a hater incident. Uh, it's real simple. 
You never lose the vibe uh, that you have on stage unless you overindulge and let them take too much time or have uh, too much of your mental harmony in the first place, which is why you know it's going to happen. You expect it to be happen. You ignore if possible. You do not inflame. Then you ignore if possible. You acknowledge with a smile. This is, I mean it, this is five seconds of work. That's an interesting comment that you just made. Uh, I want to address it, but I'm not sure it's central. Let me come talk to you as soon as I'm done, okay? Thank you very much for the input. Maybe eight seconds and you're done. Your vibe, your mental harmony will still be flowing unless you allow yourself to go on for 10 and 20 seconds or longer. And the surefire way to do that is to let a conversation unfold. You only let that conversation unfold when you have no choice because of their status or the central nature of what they're saying, your belief the whole audience might be interested, etc. But for your typical hater incident, no, it's about polite response in an effort to sequester them to a conversation you'll have later. Do you stick to your beliefs even if that one last question? I love it. Do you stick to your beliefs even if the group has a different view? Limbo, thank you so much for that question. The short answer is yes, but I have a caveat because I do respect that we're talking about a professional context here, which means that yes, I want you to have voice. I could go on all day about that. On the other hand, it's also true that you have to understand and respect the norms in the group, the precedents in the group, the beliefs in the group. That's a context that has implications for you. So I believe that you wanna understand those as a means of shaping how much you will indulge in sharing your beliefs. You don't wanna simplistically ever give up your beliefs. The question is when and how energetically will you stand up for them? That's a strategic question. You are not betraying your beliefs and values if you censor one once in a while looking for the smarter time and place to speak up. But you are never wise to always, always defend your views loudly and proudly the way some people preach that we should because that is not strategically possible and it's guaranteed to cause you problems. Sometimes I wonder if I can go for a half hour just ranting about these topics. Other times, most of the time, I realize it's just so easy for me to fill all this time. Thank you for your questions. Listen, I will be prowling LinkedIn, looking through your comments, who joined us, who I've not yet connected with. Come on, if we haven't connected, reach out on LinkedIn. Let's connect. If you have a question you want to share privately, I want to hear from you. I would love to give you my quick take on the issue. Thanks so much for your continued support. Look soon for Live Hard and a bunch of other stuff. I just about to finish writing my second new course recently. Would you care to guess the names of the first two courses I've been, I'm going to be putting out shortly. One is called Show Your Ink, and the other is called, hey, you guessed it, Live Hard. If you haven't been to the website in a while, check it out, drdoit.com. Please sign up for the newsletter so you'll have a first look at everything before anyone else at what I've got going on. I hope the day is treating you well. Thanks for being here. I'll see you next time.